Welcome to SCOTUS Talk. I'm Amy Howe. Thanks for joining us. On October 8th, the justices heard oral argument in a trio of cases that could be some of the biggest ones at the court this term. The issue before the justices was whether Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which bars employment discrimination because of sex, protects LGBT employees. The first two cases, Bostock v. Clayton County, Georgia, and Altitude Express v. Zarda, were filed by a county employee and a skydiving instructor who alleged that they were fired because they were gay. In those cases, which were argued together, the justices were considering whether Title VII bans employment discrimination based on sexual orientation. The third case, Harris Funeral Homes v. EEOC, was filed on behalf of Amy Stevens, a transgender woman who was fired from her job as a funeral home director after she announced that she planned to come to work dressed as a woman and would eventually undergo gender reassignment surgery. The issue in that case is whether Title VII protects against discrimination based on transgender status. Joining me to talk about the oral arguments is Kevin Russell, a partner at Goldstein and Russell. Kevin, thanks for joining us. Thank you. So let's start at the very beginning. What's at stake here in these cases? So the question in both cases is whether folks who have been fired or not hired uh, because of their sexual orientation or their gender identity will have a claim under Title VII, which is the federal statute that prohibits uh, employment discrimination. Now, there are also state statutes that um, uh, directly address the question and prohibit uh, that kind of discrimination based on sexual orientation or transgender status. And so in those states, the results of this case won't uh, be as dramatic. But there are many states in which the only uh, recourse for somebody who is uh, terminated because of their uh, sexual orientation or uh, transgender status is federal law. Here's the opening argument by Stanford Law Professor Pamela Carlin, who argued on behalf of the gay employees in Bostock versus Clayton County and Altitude Express versus Zarda. We'll hear argument first this morning in case 171618, Bostock versus Clayton County and the consolidated case. Ms. Carlin. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. When an employer fires a male employee for dating men but does not fire female employees who date men, he violates Title VII. The employer has, in the words of Section 703A, discriminated against the man because he treats that man worse than women who want to do the same thing. And that discrimination is because of sex, again in the words of Section 703A, because the adverse employment action is based on the male employee's failure to conform to a particular expectation about how men should behave, namely that men should be attracted only to women and not to men. There is no analytic difference between this kind of discrimination and forms of discrimination that have been already recognized by every court to have addressed them. For example, discrimination against men who are effeminate rather than macho. Like the discrimination here, that discrimination is because of nonconformity with an expectation about how men should behave. The attempt to carve out discrimination against men for being gay from Title VII cannot be administered with either consistency or integrity. In the words of the en banc Second Circuit, it forces judges to resort to lexical bean counting, where they count up the frequency of epithets such as fag, gay, queer, real man and femme, to determine whether or not discrimination is based on sex or sexual orientation. That attempt is futile because when a man is discriminated against for being gay, he is discriminated against for not conforming to an expectation about how men should behave. Finally, The possibility that some employers, but not the employers here, may have policies of denying employment opportunities both to gay men and to lesbians does not change the unlawfulness of what was alleged by the employees here. Labeling those policies under an umbrella uh, uh, phrase like sexual orientation discrimination cannot hide the fact that such an employer is a double discriminator. It discriminates against men who do not conform to a male uh, stereotype, and it discriminates against women who do not conform to an expectation about female. So, Kevin, before we get into the substance of the oral argument, let's talk about a new rule for lawyers issued just before the start of the term known as the two-minute rule. How does the rule work, and what do lawyers think about it? 
So previously, uh, as soon as you got up and started talking to the justices, any justice could jump in and ask you a question. Could and, and, and often did. did. <laughs> Frequently did. Uh, sometimes even before you got your first sentence out. And so what the Supreme Court has now decided is that they will agree that each advocate will get two minutes at the beginning of his or her uh, presentation uh, to speak uninterrupted. And at the end of that, then they'll jump in like, the, like they have before. Uh, I suspect that this is a welcome... Uh, development for a lot of folks, uh, but not for everyone. I mean, there are some of us who aren't all that comfortable getting up there and giving speeches. At the same time, in cases, particularly in a case like this, which is when the arguments are somewhat complicated, uh, it, I think, will be a nice thing to be able to get that argument out uh, in some length uh, before you start getting interrupted. Because as you see, if you look at the transcript or listen to the, the recording of this argument, once the justices got going, it was very difficult at times to get a word in edgewise. Yes, yes, indeed. Justice Elena Kagan laid out the argument that the phrase in Title VII, because of sex, includes discrimination based on sexual orientation and presumably also transgender status. Here's Justice Kagan. General, could I go back to your opening statement and particularly to the second part of it? You talked about the history of, mm -hmm. of, of Title VII and some of the subsequent legislative history. And I guess what strikes me, and I was struck in reading your briefs too, is that um, the arguments you're making, I would say, uh, are not ones we typically would accept. For many years, the lodestar of this court's statutory interpretation has been the text of a statute, not the legislative history, and certainly not the subsequent legislative history. And the text of the statute appears to be pretty firmly in Ms. Carlin's corner. Um, did you discriminate against somebody, um, uh, against her client because of sex? Yes, you did, because you uh, fired the person because this was a man who loved other men. And part of that, and it only has to be part, we've made very clear there's no search for sole cause in Title VII, Part of that is you fired the person because he was a man. If he were a woman, he wouldn't have been fired. This is the usual kind of way in which we interpret statutes now. We look to laws. We don't look to right. predictions. We don't look to desires. We don't look to wishes. We look to laws. Why doesn't that mean your argument fail? Kevin, were the other justices persuaded by this argument? A lot of the conservative justices in particular talk about how important it is to look at the text of the statute. Yeah, so there were, I think, two sets of things going on. Uh, you know, first, I would say, you know, the liberal justices were persuaded by Justice Kagan. And so the real question in this case is, were any of the conservative justices? Now, I will say, uh, we didn't really get any meaningful questions from Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Thomas, as is his usual. I uh, didn't ask any questions either. So we don't know if they were persuaded by it or not. Uh, Justice Alito seemed quite clearly not persuaded uh, by it, in part because he is not a strict textualist like some of the other conservatives, and he cares about other things like, do we really think that the people who passed the statute in 1964 thought they were outlawing discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation? And his answer was no. No, he clearly thought no, and he clearly thought that was pretty much dispositive. Uh, the Chief Justice also asked questions that suggested that he wasn't persuaded uh, by the textual argument. Uh, and so it really came down uh, to whether it would persuade Justice Gorsuch. It did seem like Justice Gorsuch might be the key vote in this case. And here he is questioning David Cole of the American Civil Liberties Union, who argued on behalf of Amy Stevens. The question, though, again, I'm sorry to pose it, but I'm going to give you one more shot. Yeah. All right. When a case is really close, really close on the textual evidence, and I... Assume for the moment, I'm, no. I'm with you on the textual evidence, it's close, okay? We're, we're not talking about extra textual stuff, we're talking about the text, it's close. A judge finds it very close. At the end of the day, should he or she take into consideration the massive social upheaval that would be entailed in such a decision and the possibility that, that Congress didn't think about it so, and that, um, that that is a more effect, more appropriate legislative rather than a judicial function. That, that's it. It's a question of judicial modesty. So, first of all, federal courts of appeals have been recognizing that discrimination against transgender people is sex discrimination for 20 years. There's been no upheaval. As I was saying, there are transgender male lawyers in this courtroom following the male dress code, 
and going to the men's room, and the, 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 the court's dress code and sex segregated restrooms have not fallen. So the notion that somehow this is going to be a huge upheaval, we haven't seen that upheaval for 20 years. There's no reason to, you, you would see that upheaval. Transgender people follow the rule that's associated with their gender identity. It's not disruptive. So were you surprised by this question from Justice Gorsuch, and how do you think he's ultimately likely to end up in a case? So I wasn't surprised that Justice Gorsuch was taking the textual arguments very seriously. Uh, He is probably among the most uh, committed members of the court to textualism and has shown himself willing uh, to go ways that are sort of unexpected for a Republican appointee uh, based on his view of the text. Uh, And so I think a lot of folks, including me, going into this expected him uh, to take the textual arguments very seriously. Uh, At the same time, you know, one of the reasons conservatives like textualism is because they view it as a way to keep the judge's personal preferences out of it and to leave big political and social questions to the legislative process. And those instincts are pulling him in different directions, you can see in this question. On the one hand, he wants to be a textualist, and he he thinks there's something to the textual argument. On the other hand, that conclusion is going to lead him to a place where the Supreme Court is going to end up deciding a question that he thinks uh, ordinarily ought to be decided by the legislatures. And he's asking, what do I do? Uh, if it's a close, qu- a close question on the text, should I take into account uh, that this is a big uh, social issue that we would ordinarily not want the courts to be deciding? And that's different for him, perhaps, from a constitutional issue that the legislature can't decide? Possibly. Uh, you know, I, I do think that he probably still has the instinct. Uh, if this was a constitutional case, he would still be concerned about the Supreme Court deciding a, a controversial social question. Uh, but particularly when it's always available to Congress to go back and change whatever the Supreme Court does here, he may think uh, that the, the wise thing to do, the proper thing to do, is to leave it to Congress and say it doesn't cover this kind of conduct. So what is the counter-argument based on the text made in particular by the federal government and the lawyers for the employers in these cases? So they say that when, they say that Justice Kagan's uh, explanation is not looking at it the right way and that what you need to do is not ask simply, uh, would the plaintiff have been treated differently if he was a woman, but ask if he would have been treated differently if he was a gay woman and that you need to hold the sexual orientation constant in order to fairly determine whether this is because of sex as opposed to as of because of sexual orientation. And they say if the employer would have fired a lesbian woman as well as a gay man, they're not discriminating between men and women. They're just discriminating on the basis of sexual orientation, which they say is different. It's not what Congress meant when it said you can't discriminate because of sex. So if you look beyond the text, we heard quite a lot from lawyers for the employers and the more conservative justices about what what they saw as the potential broader consequences of a ruling for the plaintiffs. In particular, we heard a lot about bathrooms and dress codes. Can you explain both what their concerns were and the counterarguments to them? So their concern was that if they held that simply treating men and women differently Uh, can constitute discrimination and in violation of Title VII, well, then what about bathrooms? Because bathrooms, uh, when you tell a man you can't use the women's bathroom, uh, and you would have said if you are a woman, you can use the women's bathroom, isn't that also discrimination? And if we accept your theory uh, about uh, sexual orientation discrimination, doesn't that mean that we're going to have to let the men use the women's bathroom? Uh, The response to that is a little bit, complicated and and gets into the weeds a bit, but what the other side says is, look, Title VII doesn't simply say that it's illegal to treat men and women differently. They say it's illegal to treat them differently in a way that harms them. And for most people, uh, requiring you to use the men to use the men's bathroom and women to use the women's bathroom doesn't cause them any harm. And so even though it is discrimination on the basis of sex, it's not illegal. Now they say that could be different for a transgendered person. Uh, if you say that a transgendered person's sex within the meaning of the statute is the this, is this sexual assignment they got when they were born, uh, telling that person who was born, as they say, as, as a man, but is now uh, her gender identity as a woman, telling that person uh, that you have to use the men's bathroom would be harmful to them, and they say that would violate Title VII in a way that doesn't 
uh, arise with folks who are, are not transgendered. We also heard a lot about a case called Price Waterhouse versus Hopkins. Can you explain both what that case was and how it factors into the party's arguments? So that was a case in which a woman uh, was denied a promotion because the employer said, not because you're a woman, but because you're a woman who behaves too aggressively. You know, it's, it's not ladylike. Um, and what the Supreme Court said in that case is, yes, that is sex discrimination because if uh, the woman had been a man and acting aggressively, uh, you would not have, uh, you would have given her the promotion. Given her a medal. <laughs> exactly. And so you're, be you're treating her differently because of her sex. And what the, the plaintiffs in these cases say, the same thing applies here, uh, if, particularly because a lot of people uh, who get discriminated because of their sexual orientation, it's because they are not acting the way that you would expect a man or a woman to act. You, you know, it's, sometimes the, a man who is perceived to be gay uh, could be fired for being effeminate. Uh, and they would say, we're not discriminating on sexual orientation, we're just discriminating uh, because you are being effeminate. And that pretty clearly would violate Price Waterhouse because you wouldn't fire a woman for being effeminate. And the plaintiffs in this case say it's the same thing with sexual orientation. You are firing people because they are not complying with gender norms about the kind of people they should be attracted to. Is there a counter-argument from the employers and the federal government? So the government has also held open the possibility that under Price Waterhouse it would be illegal to, uh, to fire a gay man because he is effeminate. That is, that is sex stereotyping. Uh, and so one likely consequence, if uh, the plaintiffs lose in these cases, is that a lot of sexual orientation discrimination cases are going to turn into Price Waterhouse stereotyping cases in which they're going to be claiming, uh, I wasn't fired because I was gay, I was hired, fired because I was effeminate. Uh, and that's actually particularly likely to happen in states where it's illegal under state law to discriminate based on sexual orientation because an employer is not going to be, say, be able to say, no, no, I didn't fire you because you're effeminate, I fired you because you're gay, because that would be admitting to violating state law. So is this a case in which the court can reach some kind of compromise ruling, or is it really just a matter of the court saying either Title VII protects LGBT employees or it doesn't? For the most part, I think the court will say either Title VII covers this or it doesn't. but. Uh, even the government has acknowledged that there are some forms of discrimination out there against gay people, for example, that would violate Title VII. So, for example, if uh, an employer won't hire gay men but will hire lesbians, uh, they say that that is sex discrimination because you are treating those two groups of people differently because of sex. And do you think that the court is likely to reach the same conclusion about the applicability of Title VII in both cases to say either it protects based on sexual orientation and transgender status uh, or it doesn't, you know, it's not going to split the difference? It's theoretically possible that they could split the difference, but I'd be very surprised if they do. I think that there will be a majority on the court who will either accept the textual argument, in which case they will accept it for both cases, or a majority uh, is going to form around the idea that it's a close call, maybe on the text, but we're quite confident Congress didn't mean to protect either of these categories of employees, and so uh, we're going to leave it to Congress to change the law if it wants to. And we're going to have to wait to find out. Kevin Russell, thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure. That's another episode of SCOTUS Talk. Thanks for joining us. Thanks to Case Text, our sponsor, and thanks to our production team, Katie Bart, Cal Goldie, and Edith Roberts.